American cheese isn't cheese. And in many ways, it is barely American. So just what are these questionably delicious bright orange squares? This video was brought to you by Squarespace, the website hosting platform through which to run your business. In order to understand American cheese, we first need to appreciate cheese cheese, which is what brings me to the Point Reyes Farmstead Cheese Company in Northern California. This is their robotic milking facility. No, these aren't milking robots, they're milking cows. Because of the automated system, cows are able to decide how much they get milked. For this farm's 330 Holocenes, typically that's about three times a day, producing 10 liters or two and a half gallons of milk in every session. Like with other baby mammals, calves rely on their mother's milk in order to get all their required proteins, fats, vitamins, and minerals in order for them to grow. Their digestive systems just aren't capable of dealing with regular solid food. To slow this milk's progression through their digestive systems, calves produce a series of enzymes known as rennet, which coagulate the fluid into solid curds and liquid whey. By doing this process outside the calf's body, and then pressing together the curds to drain away the whey, we get what is commonly known as cheese. Carefully selected cultures of bacteria will ferment the cheese, breaking down the milk proteins to give a variety of textures and flavors. With small variations in initial starting products and processing methods, we can produce a staggering variety of cheeses. These are some of the cheeses produced at the farmstead, well, globally, there are more than 2,000 varieties. Milk's high nutrient content, optimized for the needs of growing calves, means that microorganisms love cheese just as much as we do. While some natural colonies, such as the penicillin roquefort of blue cheese, add extra flavor, others, like E. coli, can cause food poisoning and even death. Because of this, and before the advent of modern refrigeration, cheese rarely made its way outside of the community that produced it, making it unaffordable and inaccessible for most of the world's population. American cheese came along with the goal of changing that. If you're anything like me, then chances are you've got a bunch of bananas in your kitchen somewhere slowly turning brown, with the promise of turning them into banana bread rather than just throwing them out. Chances are you'll buy another bunch next week, and another the week after. In 1795, this same problem of food spoilage was getting in the way of Napoleon's conquest of Europe. Since an army marches on its stomach, getting a reliable source of safe food was of paramount importance. This prompted Napoleon to offer the 1795 equivalent of a quarter million US dollars for anyone who could solve the problem of long-term food preservation. Enter French candy maker Nicolas Saper, who, with zero scientific understanding, but 14 years of just trying stuff out, discovered that by taking his rations, putting them in a glass jar, sealing it tightly, and then boiling it for five hours, they could be preserved for years at a time, tasting just as good when they went in as when they came back out again. The reason that this works is because high temperatures kill the decay-causing microbes inside the jar, while the seal stops new ones from getting in. As long as it holds, it is impossible for the food to go off, as there are no microbes to cause decay. This is the basic principle of canned food. If we try out this heat-based sterilization with cheese, then it separates out into an unpalatable goop. Cheese is a homogeneous mixture of milk proteins, interspersed with fat globules, and of course, a lot of calcium. As cheese melts, these calcium ions force adjacent proteins to irreversibly crosslink. As they do, our fat globules get pushed out and rise to the surface. Even after the structure cools, these stay separated, and the cheese is ruined. If Aper had spent more time helping Napoleon to conquer Switzerland, rather than being in Paris making candy, then he'd have learned that the Swiss had already solved the conundrum of molten cheese a century before. How? Fondue. Fondue is a mixture of cheese and wine, which stays homogenous even when molten. That's because the acid in the wine bonds to the cheese's calcium ions, preventing them from being involved in cross-linking. Understandably, it tastes a bit like wine, which is great, but not necessarily what you want to be feeding your soldiers. In 1911, a pair of engineers, who were appropriately Swiss, 
came along and substituted the wine for some sodium citrate. To show you it working, I've added some of the sodium citrate into our original cheese. Now, when we melt it, it stays homogenous, and when it reforms, it goes back to its original constitution. It came too late for Napoleon, but soldiers have been eating this canned processed cheese since World War I. You can even buy it as a civilian in Australia, where, as you can see, it still contains that sodium citrate. This one doesn't need to be refrigerated, and has a best before date of 2040, making it perfect for a country which routinely experiences Mad Max style societal collapse every time the price of iron ore falls. Originally, American cheese was just this French proposed, Swiss perfected form of meltable long life cheese, often made by combining together the cheaper offcuts of cheddar, Colby, and other cheap cheeses. It was commercialized by Canadian born industrialist James Kraft while he was living in Chicago, branding it as American cheese entirely as a marketing gimmick. This is a block of true American cheese, which I constructed using the 1916 patent. I made it with some really nice high quality cheeses, meaning that it too is delicious. As an extra bonus, the properties which allowed it to survive heat based sterilization also means that it melts beautifully into mac and cheese or on the top of a burger. Since 1900, US cheese consumption has grown from 2 to 18 kilograms per person per year, in large part due to the accessibility and affordability of long life American cheese. But with big growth and bigger profits, comes the tendency to take some pretty disastrous shortcuts. One of the key limitations of this processed American cheese was that it still required a lot of cheese cheese in order to produce. Now, that cheese cheese is typically pretty expensive. In the early years, they could get away with effectively free offcuts, but as demand for the American sort grew, they needed to get dedicated sources. As a lover of true proper cheese, I think that sounds like a massive waste. Kraft thought so too, but from a more economic perspective, sourcing all that cheese was getting really expensive. Now, a much cheaper dairy product is milk and, in some cases, butter, because these require a lot less processing. Therefore, Kraft started to substitute the cheese cheese for these cheaper other dairy products. By adding in a little bit of flavor compounds, no one was any the wiser. In the mid-1990s, this substitution got taken to the extreme. Coke membrane systems had just invented polyethyl sulfone membrane. This, by the way, is a tea strainer, but should give you the right idea. It was filled with tiny holes, which were able to filter milk into its constituent components, including a powdery protein-rich substance known as milk protein concentrate. Because milk of any quality, including exceptionally low quality, can be made into milk protein concentrate, and this concentrate can last for two years without needing to be refrigerated, as you might expect, milk protein concentrate is easy to get and exceptionally cheap. As you might have also guessed, Kraft started to substitute some of the cheese-derived milk proteins with some of these concentrate milk proteins. Cheese naturally has some variance in the amount of protein which it contains. As an extra bonus, by adding in more or less of the concentrate, differences between batches could be evened out, giving consumers a more consistent and thus more desirable product. But with all of these additions, substitutions, and processing, can we still call it cheese? Fortunately, there is one place with the definite answer. This is Title 21, Parts 100 to 199 of the US Code of Federal Regulations, effectively the food part of the Food and Drug Administration. Among other things, it outlines standards of identity for all the foods recognized by the US government, letting us know what must be in and what must not be in certain foods in order for them to be branded as such. If you don't obey these standards, then you can still sell your safe product as food, but you can't label it as one of these protected categories. Let's take a look at some of the 52 pages on cheese, starting with Gorgonzola. Oh, I do like a bit of gorgonzola. To name your cheese gorgonzola, it must be characterized by the presence of blue-green mold Pelicillum rockthrot throughout the cheese. The minimum milk fat content is 50% by weight of solids, and the maximum moisture content is 42%. Effectively, that stops you selling water as cheese. 
We also see that it needs to be matured for 90 days and get a pretty detailed description of the production method as well as the temperatures and times that must be involved during that production. We get a list of optional ingredients which you can include if you want to, but you don't have to. If you want to add something else, like wasabi, that is not on the required or optional ingredients list, then you can't sell your cheese as gorgonzola. There are two standards dealing with American cheese of relevance to us today. First of all, we have pasteurized processed cheese made of almost entirely real cheeses with a little amount of extra ingredients as required. This is the original American cheese that we made earlier. We also have pasteurized processed cheese food, which allows you to add in many more milk fats and solids as long as these don't exceed 49% of the final product. 51% still has to be real cheese. When Kraft started to add in the milk protein concentrate, which they knew wasn't one of the approved ingredients, importantly, they kept the name the same, despite this no longer being allowed. Incredibly, no one noticed until 2002, when during a routine inspection, the FDA noticed that this unknown ingredient was being added into Kraft singles. Understandably a bit upset, they gave Kraft an ultimatum, either remove this product from the cheese, or you had to stop calling it cheese at least the federally regulated terms of cheese. Kraft went with this second option, quietly rebranding themselves from food to product, a legally meaningless term, allowing them to continue adding this milk protein concentrate. Other companies which had also been using the ingredient did the same, and I've had a lot of fun going around my local supermarket to see which cheeses are legally cheese and which other ones are entirely made up. American cheese isn't cheese, but I don't think it has to be. It's got us through two world wars and brought affordable cheese consumption to the masses. The same masses who today have caused a renaissance in local specialty cheese production. And who knows, when the apocalypse finally does arrive, perhaps it'll be cans of bright orange cheese which pull us through the Thunderdome. Until then, this has been James Dingley from the Atomic Frontier. Keep looking up. Ahoy there! It is I, Captain Sailout, and this is the wondrous land of Squarespace. As a captain of a pirate crew, I need a way of disseminating information very efficiently. Fortunately, Squarespace, with their all-in-one website builder, has got me covered. You can set up an email campaign to send out maps of your buried treasure, or write a series of blog posts with embedded images and video to share stories of your quest. You can link that to your social media to share with yet more pirates. To have a free trial, head over to squarespace.com or for the premium version and 10% discount, squarespace.com slash atomicfrontier.